Hello and welcome to a new interview on the program with Carrie Smith. My guest today is a little bit different than some of the people I've interviewed before. He is not going to show his face. He uh, protects his identity. He runs a very popular site. It's narcsite.com and YouTube channel called HG Tutor, Knowing the Narcissist. Um, he is a self-identified narcissist and he teaches people how to identify such predators. I want to use the word predator, but I don't want to insult him, <laughs> such types of people and to understand them better. So please welcome HG Tutor. Thank Hello, you, Carrie. Pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for being here. I'll just get this out of the way. I told you before we started, but I'll say it so everyone knows I am a little nervous. It will pass. I'm nervous because I started listening to your videos about a year and a half ago and they were very helpful for me. And, mm -hmm. but over time I started to realize like, I have a good feeling for you. Like, I really like you. <laughs> I, I don't know you, but I feel like I like you. And at the same time, I know what you are. And so I'm like, be careful with this person. But wh why is that? Why are people drawn to you? Even though you're flat out saying, this is what I am. Well, first of all, when you listen to my work and read my work, at the forefront of your mind is not necessarily this. Oh, he's a narcissistic psychopath. He's a narcissistic psychopath. That isn't what's going through your mind the whole time. If you think, for example, there'll be certain pop stars or rock stars whose work you enjoy. Authors, scriptwriters, actors. And many of those individuals are, of course, narcissists. You might not realize that, but they've never done anything to you. They've never caused you a problem. And you can enjoy their work irrespective of what they do elsewhere. Indeed, there'll be some people that work you admire and enjoyed, and then you learn something about them and think, well, that's rather disappointing because I liked that person's work. But often you recognize, well, I can still enjoy that person's work irrespective of the fact that they're a total douche canoe. Now, in some instances, your moral fiber suggests, well, I can't continue to engage with that individual knowing what I know about them. The whole point is that if I was red and tooth and claw from the very beginning, I would have next to no clients, next to no listeners, next to no viewers. And the point is, I am demonstrating to you with complete honesty what I am. That's why, that's the benefit of hiding my identity so that you can get this raw honesty so that I can tell you everything that I do, the things that I say, the way that I behave and my kind behave, so that you have that. Mm -hmm. well, otherwise, I wouldn't be able to do that. And actually, I put you in a very informed position. I tell you from the very beginning when you embrace my work, although some people don't always get to this, I am a narcissistic psychopath. And that means that I manipulate and use people. And yes, I hurt people. From my worldview, they deserve it. I recognize that there are other people that deem that they don't deserve it. But also, through what I do, both professionally and through what I call blog world, I make life a lot better for many people. And at the end of the day, nobody, nobody is a saint that is without having caused a problem to somebody in their lives. Mm -hmm. And... I leave it up to people because I recognize that the majority of people that embrace my work demonstrate decent intelligence and above. And I allow them to make their own mind up. If you don't like me and you don't like my work, don't listen to me. Don't watch my videos. You can go elsewhere. I don't care. You won't upset me. But if you do want can to watch and listen, then you will learn far more about my kind than you will get anywhere else. Can can I ask you, I, I asked a few people uh, if they had questions for you in advance of this interview. And one of the big yeah. questions people have then is, why are you doing this? Are, are you the narcissist with the heart of gold? Are you the serial killer no, Dexter no, who no. takes out the bad people? <laughs> well, there is an aspect of what I do that is a bit Dexter-esque, I would confess. But the reason that I do this is in accordance with what I explain in virtually every video that I create. I do not suspend my narcissism when I'm talking to you. 
So therefore, what governs my interaction with you, and I'm conscious of this because I'm an aware narcissist, is the pursuit of my prime aims. Therefore, you are on my radar. I must control you. Well, that's easy because you've come to me asking me questions. You've not immediately started off by saying, well, here we are with H.G. Tudor, who's a hateful human being, and I think he's an absolute asshat, which would challenge my sense of control. You're being polite and you're listening to me, and you've invited me on your show. I receive fuel from your responses, like I would do from anybody that I would interact with. Rates and residual benefits. The residual benefit is that I reach other people that I might not ordinarily do so. So my interaction with you is governed by the prime aims. Why do I do what I do in terms of telling everybody about narcissism? Again, it is commensurate with the prime aims. The main reason is this. At some point, it's a long way away, I will die, like we all will. Death is the ultimate threat to my control. I will therefore create a legacy by allowing people to understand about narcissism and psychopathy so that when I die, when I shuffle off this mortal coil, my work will live on afterwards. So when one envisages that Grim Reaper pays me a visit and is about to bring that adamantine blade down and sever my connection to this earth plane, I won because I'll live on afterwards. And yeah. that's why I do it. I don't do it because I care about people. I care about me. I don't do it because I want people to like me. If they do, jolly good. That's positive fuel. But I do it because I'm creating a legacy, uh, which, is a, which is a residual benefit. Everything that I do, like any other narcissist, Kerry, when it comes to another human being, is linked to the prime aims. Control, fuel, character traits, and residual benefits every single time. So as I've said before, if I'm on my own and I pour myself a glass of FOSS mineral water, I do so because I'm thirsty. That's nothing to do with the prime aims. Should my girlfriend appear after going running and she looks thirsty and she's perspiring and I pour her a drink, I haven't poured her a drink because I care. I poured a drink to control her and cause her to give me fuel by her thanks. Mm. I triangulate her with the drink. If she's painted black, I stand there and drink all the mineral water, leaving her thirsty and she gets upset. I then draw fuel from her and control her in a different way. Can I ask you, you kind of, uh, you said a lot there. One of the things you said that, that leads into one of my questions is you mentioned that you're an aware narcissist and you often yeah. break down different types of narcissists. Um, I've seen you describe them as four types, victim, somatic, cerebral, and elite. But I've also heard you talk a lot about, you sort of just uh, roughly say they're lesser narcissists, mid-range, and then you describe yourself as ultra. Can mm. It seems to me that... Um, based on several of the videos I've seen that you tend to think a lot of narcissists are not aware of what they are. Is that the case? Most aren't. Correct. Most aren't. I have a framework that I devised to enable people to understand this subject more readily, uh, not using scientific or psychological terms, but ones that people can access readily. If people want to understand more about it, they can go to my YouTube channel and watch the ultra framework where I set it out in more detail, but very quickly, there are cadres of narcissists, which you've just touched on, somatic, cerebral, elite, and victim. Those denote preferences. Then there are the schools running all the way from lower lesser at the bottom all the way up to me, the ultra. Those are the schools which denote behaviors, conduct, outlook. There are similarities with all of those narcissists. One, none of us have emotional empathy. But then there are differences. Some are aware, some are not. Some operate a facade, some do not. Some routinely physical, use physical violence as a means of manipulation, others do not, and so on and so forth. So there are similarities and differences. The point is, the vast majority of narcissists don't know what they are, and those are what I term lesser and mid-range. This is something I've, I've grappled with for a long time, de dealing with... with uh, just, just dealing with one person in particular of some people <laughs> that I uh, suspect are narcissists, I go back and forth on, do they, are they aware when they engage in things like DARVO, which is uh, defined as mm -hmm. deny and, and reverse victim offender, are they aware that they're doing it or do they really not know what they're doing? No, or, an or, unaware narcissist isn't it? They don't know. An unaware narcissist is not aware. No, they're not aware. So wow. take, take for example, okay, 
if you close your eyes, okay, you can't see. So if I was to be doing something in front of you while your eyes were closed, and I said to you, what am I doing? You wouldn't know because you aren't able to see me. So similarly with a narcissist, they are not allowed to know the reality of what they're doing because the narcissism has to do that in order to make itself effective. And one thing that victims of narcissists very much struggle with, and it's understandable, is that because they know why they do things, they can't comprehend that the narcissist doesn't know. But it's all about differing perspectives. You see, if I was about to push a sharp stick towards your eye, you would not do this. Oh, look. HG is poking a sharp stick towards my eye. That could blind me. I'd better move my head back and knock the stick out of the way. You wouldn't think that way. You'd instinctively jerk your head back and bash the stick away to protect yourself. The narcissism is the same way. If an unaware narcissist had to do this, this person is threatening my sense of control. I now need to do something to get control over them. What are my options? Well, I could do this or this or this. It's too late. The control's lost. They're in trouble already. It has to be instinctive because they don't have the narc craft, if I can describe it that way, to implement the need for control promptly. And how did you come to be aware? I know some of your story, but for anyone listening who's not familiar with you, why? Are, how did you come to be an aware narcissist? It's simply the nature of my flavor of narcissism if you would there are other narcissists uh, narcissists that are aware i'm not the only one and it's a combination of intelligence and just the way that my narcissism was created that if you like that when that lottery wheel was spun as to what type of narcissist i was going to be it turned out that i was afforded insight into my condition can i ask you about emotion you said narcissists, no matter if they're lesser, mid-range, ultra, if they're aware or not aware, they all lack emotional empathy. I think a lot of people um, mm. and misinterpret that and think that narcissists don't have any emotion themselves. That's not true, is it? I mean, do you have emotion? Certainly. We have a limited range, so we experience fury, hatred, jealousy envy, antipathy, frustration. There is elation, which is linked to the receipt of fuel. There's infatuation. But we don't experience happiness in the way that you do or sadness in the way that you do. We don't love. Narcissism creates something that causes unaware narcissists to believe that they love, but it isn't the actual love in the way that you experience it as someone with emotional empathy. Now, the unaware narcissist is none the wiser. They believe that they love, so they do. They don't realize that they don't. But you see, an analysis of the way that they behave shows that they clearly aren't loving because they're abusing. And also their form of love is what contributes to the, what is essentially romantic love. All of the shiny stuff, the leaping around, the reciting the poetry at length, the standing beneath the balcony, the pouring rain and throwing up flowers, all of that. That's not actually. That's I'm not smiling that. because I know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the manifestation. And what, what, what happens is there's nothing wrong with someone throwing a little bit of romance into the mix. But what narcissists do is it's all predicated on that form of romance with particular styles of narcissists because we don't actually love. So it's all about the show, gifts flattery, ground gestures. I can't wait to marry you. You've only met me five minutes ago. Yes. But already talking about, I want to marry you and have children, which to some people think, oh my goodness me, they must really be into me if they're saying those things. Yes. Which it's in the your world, bombing. yes, in our world, yes, it is. They're disposable props that are there to be utilized in order to draw you in. The narcissist, me the unaware narcissist means all of those things when he or she says them. But as soon as they're said, they evaporate into the ether and they may never be revisited again. You talk about, I mean, and this is something I've read in other literature as well, that the, the tactic for how to deal, if you, if you attract a, a narcissist into your life, um, if you suspect that you are dealing with a narcissist, that you should go no contact. Can, can you explain yeah. why? And you said in one of your videos, 
even if they're lesser narcissists, it's it, you. You were saying it's not that they're some, uh, you know, incredible superhero like figure. It's just that even with the lesser narcissists, everything's going to come back on you twofold if you're trying to like defeat them. Can you can you explain why? Mm -hmm. So, when you engage with a narcissist, along comes what I call the devil's pitchfork, which has a number of prongs that affect you. First of all, you will provide us with fuel. So if you shout and scream at us, if you show irritation, if you use words that insult us, you're still giving us fuel and we want that. Thus, we are winning. Secondly, you may well increase your risk of being hoovered by us because you've come up on the radar and you've kicked the hornet's nest. Thirdly, you're likely to suffer some form of adverse reaction. Because if you're engaging with someone who must control you and is an abuser, there's a good chance that they will turn around and hit you or call you horrible names, or they won't give you the answers that you're seeking. They'll take you into a circular conversation. You'll become frustrated, or they'll tell you something that you didn't want to hear. And why expose yourself to all of that? Fourthly, as an empathic individual, you may well have... Uh, or if you're an empathic individual, you have the addiction to the narcissist, which creates emotional thinking. Emotional thinking is misleading. If you engage with a narcissist, you increase your emotional thinking. And it basically, it essentially means you take leave of your senses. So what you end up doing is you start making bad decisions. So what happens, for example, is an individual may or may not know they're dealing with a narcissist and they decide... I need him to explain to me why he ended this relationship. I'm owed that explanation. I don't understand why it ended. I don't understand why he didn't properly tell me why it had ended. And I don't understand why he's now running around town with Annie Nonickers. So I'm going to go and see him and ask him, why on earth has he done this to me? All of that seems eminently logical, doesn't it? Get an explanation mm -hmm. from why your boyfriend has run off with somebody else. But if they are a narcissist, it isn't logical. Why? You can go and see that individual... He doesn't want to see you. He's chosen someone else. And he turns around and he's nasty to you, which upsets you. So you've just been devalued. Furthermore, you don't get any answers because he refuses to talk to you. He just stands there and insults you. Therefore, you've suffered a further devaluation by the virtue of that frustration. You've also given him some fuel, which is he'll take. Thank you very much. You've then potentially raised the risk of him hoovering you further because he sees you as a nuisance. And also you will then increase your emotional thinking. And rather than do this, I'm dealing with a narcissist. He's not going to answer my questions. And all I'm going to do is keep getting hurt. I should walk away and stay away and just satisfy myself with knowing he's a narcissist. This is what narcissists do. And fight down any desire to get answers out of him. Indeed, I'll go and watch HG Tudor's videos because that's where I'll find the answers. You go there. You do this. But why won't he tell me? I need to know. I want him to know how I've been hurt. I need to understand why he's chosen somebody else. That's not logical. Mm -hmm. And so the point is that if you go no contact, you don't give us any fuel. That means you win. You will not increase your emotional thinking. That means you win. You reduce your risk of being hoovered. That means you win. And you won't suffer an adverse consequence. You win. Furthermore, we absolutely hate it. If you go no contact with us when we try to hoover you and we can't, it makes us feel weak, unimportant, vulnerable. We can't stand it. We eventually deal with it in some shape or form, as I've explained in many of my videos. But many people think, oh, no, I'll go in there and I'll manipulate the narcissist. You're trying to take on somebody who manipulates as easy as they breathe. And all you're doing is falling into a trap. And it's Can not me you? saying, oh... It's, uh, it's not me saying, oh, uh, narcissists are, you know, uh, com uh, completely impregnable and this is, we're so high and mighty, don't bother trying to deal with this. I'm explaining this to you so that people understand that if you enter onto our battlefield, we will win because it's our battlefield. You win the war by never fighting it. Hmm. What about people who, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a personal example. I don't talk about this on camera a lot, but uh, when I was listening to you, when I first started listening to you a year and a half ago, I took your advice with someone who um, engages in constant public attacks. And so mm -hmm. there's that knee jerk, uh, sort of that need to defend oneself against 
you know, this bully or this liar. And, 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 but I took your advice for three months. Um, mm -hmm. Didn't acknowledge the attacks at all. Didn't even hit like on any, you know, social media tweets about this, per nothing. And the attacks actually increased the number of them. The frequency increased during that period well, of what they call gray why, rock. How, how did you know that these attacks were increasing? Because people started sending me messages and videos, strangers. Like, did you know this person, okay. this video? And well, well, and so then, then you're not, I broke you're, it. Not, you're not in a no contact scenario, you see. Right. Okay. So would you, I, I suspected your answer would be, I should have waited. Just don't, don't break it no matter what. Like I didn't, I didn't in, go. In, indeed. <clears throat> There's two points then, to the no contact. There's two points to the no contact regime. And the first is that if you manage to remove yourself from the horizon or radar of the narcissist, you don't exist. And the only way that you will then come up on that narcissist radar is if someone mentions you, they're reminded of you by something, or you just pop in their head. So if you're not going around to see them and you're not sending them messages and you're not talking about them elsewhere you reduce the likelihood of you coming upon their radar. And then, but you can't completely remove it because there's nothing you can do about the fact that somebody might mention your name to them or they look at something which has reminded them of your existence or you just pop into their head. However, if they can't reach you, they can't contact you, they can't ring you up, they can't send you a text message, they can't come round to where you are, uh, because you don't live there anymore, or if they do, you won't open the door. The fact is, you will not know in most instances about the fact that they're talking about you or that they've tried to contact you because you have a solid no-contact regime. And so with the example that you'd given, although that individual was continuing to smear you, okay, if you didn't look or you had issued an instruction to people, look, if this person's saying things about me, I don't want to know about it. I've cut this individual out of my life. I appreciate your support, but I don't want to hear about it. And they don't send you anything. Your life is going to be so much better because you won't hear anything about the attacks. And mm -hmm. ultimately, what you've got to remember is that when a narcissist is smearing you, that is a form of control. It's a second assertion of control. And when that smearing takes place, too often, empathic individuals driven by their truth seeker trait do this. I don't like the fact that this person is telling porky pies about me. That's not very nice. I'm now going to go and ask them why they're doing it, set them straight, and tell them they mustn't do it. But you're dealing with a narcissist. So when you do that, you're threatening the narcissist's sense of control. So all the narcissist will do is attack you even more because you're threatening their sense of control. So if you don't respond to them, the likelihood of the attacks is reduced. If you ensure that you have no knowledge of the attacks, it's not going to trouble you. Now, when you're being smeared, those that hear the smear or see the smear fall into three groups. And this is very important. There'll be a group of people who believe that you are Satan, that you're Beelzebub, and you won't change their view. So forget about trying. Because all you'll do is upset yourself and waste your time and energy. Yes. I then agree. there's a second group of people who support you. And therefore, they know that this person is a nasty piece of work or that they're a narcissist or that they're an abuser or that they're a fruitcake, whatever your description is given to them. So you don't need to persuade your supporters yet again that this person's a fruitcake. All you're doing is bringing attention to something they already know, risk boring them, and also causing yourself to think about something that's troubling you. So you don't need to address it with your supporters. And then there's a third group of people who would listen to the smearing and think, oh dear, that's terrible. And then would listen to you and then go, oh dear, that person's the other person's terrible. And then they'll think, what shall I have for dinner tonight? Because quite simply, they don't really care <laughs> because they've got yes. bills to pay, children to feed, houses to clean. And it's tomorrow's yes. fish and chip paper. Yes, the I think that's most is, people. Most empathic victims, yeah, most empathic victims don't like people lying about them, but they have an emotional response to it where they think, I've got to do something about it. Whereas if you look at it logically, you, you approach it and think, this person isn't affecting my livelihood. 
this person is just saying nasty things about me. There'll always be people that believe that. There's nothing I can do about it, so I won't do anything about it. Uh, it's not like there's people turning up at your house with pitchforks and torches saying, burn the witch, burn the witch. It's just happening in cyberspace. And I appreciate it's not pleasant, but it's similarly, I have people talk rubbish about me, and it just amuses me because I know that they're telling lies and they're so desperate to get my attention that they do this. Yes. I'm, not going but, to, I'm not going to give them the attention that they're seeking. But do you ever, when you look at, um, this, is, this is a question I've, that's popped in my head many times over the past couple of years. When you look at people that I think society has come to agree, that person is a predator and maybe they don't put the word narcissist on it or psychopath or what yeah. have you, but they say that person's a predator, like Harvey Weinstein. That's a guy who, once the, the public temperature shifted on him, everyone was like, well, we all knew, but no one did anything. And when I look at mm -hmm. cases like that or like Epstein, I tend to think, I understand that better now. I understand mm -hmm. why people who knew what he was didn't say anything. Is, is there – how do people fight against that desire to, to – to defend others, other victims or other targets or sources of supply and, and say, and to out this person, you just have to let that go and say, you have to let it go. Your first duty is to yourself and to look to your own defenses. When you've been mauled by a narcissist, invariably your coping mechanisms have been reduced. Your emotional thinking is high and many of your assets and resources aren't as good as they once were. If you start gallivanting around on missions of mercy for other people, trying to tell everybody, he's a narcissist, he's a narcissist, you come up against this problem. One group, what does that actually mean? They don't really understand what you're talking about. Two, who are you to go around saying that about somebody else? Are you, are you right. qualified to do so? And you are in your own way because you'll be your own expert. But people, because you haven't got some letters after your name that l relate to psychology, tend to dismiss that. Thirdly, right. many people don't like conflict. And if you're going around saying, look, I'm trying to help you, but this person, you know, is a predator, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, they don't tend to want to hear it because it makes them feel uneasy. Fourthly, often those individuals are very much in the thrall of the predator. So a classic example, of course, is that you're in a romantic relationship with a narcissist who has disengaged from you and has got a new victim who's in the golden period. And you have happened upon my work and you think, oh, I now know what they are. I'm a victim. She's a victim. I need to go and warn her that she's with this predator. She's in the golden period with a man who calls her lovely names who takes her to beautiful places, who gives a great long night uh, rumpy pumpy, buys her nice gifts, treats her re really well, is great to her family and friends. And you go along and say, this man is a predator. He treated me like at first, but it'll all turn to poo later on. Who's she going to believe? You, the right. ex-girlfriend, who he's already smeared, who said, you might, get be you might be contacted by Captain Crazy at some point. She's just jealous of the fact that she's lost me where so she thinks right I, I i've got this really great guy who i don't want to lose and he warned me that you might come and start throwing manure around yeah i'm really going to listen to you aren't i you're fighting a losing battle and unfortunately in those scenarios you have to let that person find out the hard way you were reminding me of of some of the people i asked for questions when i talked to you of some of the examples they gave where it was this exact scenario where um, they were the, the second or third um, intimate partner of this narcissist and, and heard all the horrible stories about the previous girlfriends or wives. And then one day found out hey, this is who this person really is. And then there's future targets or intimate partners. And they're like, it's, it's just not, why would they believe me? It, I, I, I just need to mm. quit thinking that it's my duty to warn, you know? Well, um, there's, there's, so many, there's so many difficulties with it. First of all, it's a breach of your own no-contact regime because what are you doing? You're interacting with the narcissist, quite possibly, by confronting them. You're talking about the narcissist with other people, trying to warn the victim. You are doing things in relation to that narcissist, perhaps accumulating evidence to show this person you're thinking about them. So those are repeated breaches of no contact. So first of all, you're not doing what is best for you. Furthermore, 
You will then come up on the narcissist's radar, and the narcissist's control will be threatened, so the narcissist will then lash out you. Stay away from me. You can't handle the fact that I binge you for being a crazy person. I've got a good relationship here. If you don't stay away, I'm going to get a restraining order against you. I'm going to involve the police. You're a crazy cow. So then you get more and more worked up by those false accusations being leveled at you. Thirdly, the, vic the, the new victim is not going to listen to you because they don't. And so you are going on a fool's errand, which is detrimental to your own interests. And hard as it might be, your emotional thinking is saying, I care about this person, but also I want this predator exposed. And it's only right that they be exposed. It isn't your job to do it. Your job is to defend yourself. And some people might say, well, you know, HG, that means that these people go through life doing it again and again and again. That will happen irrespective of your attempts to unmask them because your attempts to unmask will fail unless you are in a position to accumulate clear evidence, for instance, filmed evidence of this person's behavior and that you're wealthy enough to put it across social media and mainstream media so thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people in the locality see this person's behavior, you are basically holding a match up to the sun, which won't be seen. And the problem is, is that people will just say, forget it, you know, there's two sides to every story, six of one, half a dozen of the other, because they don't understand narcissism. And they think, okay, you know, he was a, he was a shit to you and you're upset about the relationship, they don't fully understand the dynamic of what has happened. They look at it in terms of, yeah, he was nasty to you, you got burnt, you're feeling raw about it, he's not a good guy, but, you know, just move on. And you're told all of those things. And other people, they aren't really interested because they're too busy focused on their own lives. Although people don't like to hear it, what I tell you is the most effective thing for you. And those that listen to what I tell them to do eventually recognize I did what you told me, HG, and I felt so much better after a short period of time because I stayed away from the very thing that was hurting me. And by staying away, that doesn't just mean not physically being around the narcissist. It means not communicating with the narcissist, not doing things in relation to the narcissist, not talking about the narcissist, not thinking about the narcissist. Mm -hmm. I have a follow-up question to that. This is from someone who co-parents with an ex who is a narcissist. So it seems like an impossible situation. How do you go no contact with someone that you're co-parenting with? It seems impossible, but it's not. First of all, you ask the question, do I have to co-parent with this individual? You're not dealing with somebody who is adding to your life or that of the children in a constructive way that a non-narcissist would. So the starting point is, are you able actually to cut this person out of your life and say no you're not having any involvement with the children because there are circumstances where you can do that the narcissist won't like it now so long as you're not prejudicing potential court action so you'd have to take legal advice about it before you took that step but in some instances you would be justified in cutting this person out of the lives of the children and your own and therefore you are able to implement total no contact the narcissist won't like it and they'll kick up a fuss some narcissists will kick up a fuss and do nothing more because they're lazy lessers. And it's just a bit of show, and then they won't proceed with it. Mid-range narcissists are more likely to start court proceedings. And if they do, you deal with the court proceedings, and you fight them in court. And in some instances, as a consequence of the evidence that you have, you succeed and get sole custody. In other instances, you then are ordered to have either shared custody or they have contact visitation. If that's the case, you must obey the court order. Because if you don't, you'll go to prison. But even in those situations of where you are court ordered to co-parent in some shape or form, there is a lot you can do to reduce your involvement and exposure to the narcissist. And it's a huge topic, actually, Kerry. And I have a specific assistance package that deals with this called How to Co-Parent with a Narcissist. And it sets mm -hmm. out the various steps that you can take to either achieve total no contact with the narcissist or... If the court order prevents you from doing that, the steps you can take to minimize your exposure with a series of pra very practical tips to help you. I also have another package called Child Defender, which helps you protect your children against the narcissist where you have a co-parent situation. Both of those can be found in what I call the Knowledge Vault, which is a in the menu bar at narcsite.com. Mm -hmm. In essence, 
whilst it's often seen, and it is probably the hardest situation to have, having children with a narcissist, it is not an impossible one. And there is much that can be done. And my material set out the steps that can help you. And I've helped thousands of people through consultation deal with such scenarios. That's one of the most interesting things I think that you do. So you have a ton of free material and videos on your YouTube channel. Yeah. That's how I found you. But you also have, you do paid consultations with people about their specific problems. And then you have all this other content that people, uh, that is paid content that people can access. And that's right. So there's a sort of um, multidisciplinary approach to it in terms of, as you've rightly mentioned, the videos, 3,400 of them covering so many different aspects of narcissism. So you can really go down the rabbit hole with all of that material. Then I have several thousand blog articles for those that prefer to read. And then if you want to speak to me, you can. You can arrange a consultation. And then you can utilize things such as what's called the NARC detector to determine are you dealing with a narcissist and if so, which type you are. And then in the Knowledge Vault, there's over 200 products that deal with various aspects of the narcissistic dynamic, under, understanding yourself, tackling emotional thinking, how to stop hoovering, understanding what a malice campaign is, sort of wealth of material in there, which is, um, which is paid, uh, but isn't particularly expensive, and I often discount it. Mm. I know I only have you for a short time, so I did want to touch on some of the very popular series you've done around mm -hmm. current events things in the news and i've yeah. i've appreciated some of those as well because like a lot of people i was watching the amber heard and johnny depp case um yeah. gave it a lot of attention i think because it was so cathartic to see someone you said unless you have a lot of money to and you have video evidence or i was i immediately was thinking of johnny depp someone who felt it was important enough to spend that money to try and clear his name and yeah um you did a, a series of videos on Amber Heard. Can can you talk about a little bit about her and Meghan Markle and and why people are are drawn to these stories? Is it because it's cathartic? People are drawn to them because part of it's salacious gossip that you're getting an insight into people's behaviour uh, of the, of the rich and famous. You're getting a peek behind the curtains. For some people, of course, it mirrors very much their own experiences. Uh, whilst I find uh, Harry's wife, as I call her, the Duchess of Industrial Beige, an actual very boring individual, <laughs> she's fantastic in terms of enabling me to talk about narcissism <laughs> because so many people are interested in her. And I find it, of course, quite uh, an interesting indictment on human beings and that, for instance, I will make a video again about Vladimir Putin who could potentially trigger nuclear Armageddon which gets a few thousand uh, views yeah. in the space of about 24 hours. Then I do something about Harry's wife. Are the children, uh, how does a narcissist deal with children and would they invent a ch the children? It gets 60,000 views in a similar space of time. It tells you everything you need to know about what's wrong with this planet. But that said, one reason I do so much of the Harry's wife material is one, she's so prominent, but also I've had so many people contact me and say, I didn't know anything about narcissism, HG, until I watched your Harry's wife material. And then it made me realize this is similar to what's going on in my relationship, or this is happening with my father, or this is happening with my brother-in-law, etc." Mm -hmm. So it's a very good method of getting to reach people. People are interested in it because it has an impact. Uh, narcissists are far more prevalent than people realize. Many people, although knowledge about narcissism is increasing, it's still at a uh, woefully low level. And furthermore, it has all the ingredients of a he said, she said, you know, who's telling the truth, what's going on here. And of course, particularly with the Depp Heard scenario, and to an extent with uh, Will Smith and Jada Pinkett Smith, mm -hmm. you have uh, two abused men there. And with, although Johnny Depp, is far from blameless, as I explained in my detailed series about both him and Heard, he was the victim of domestic abuse. And so for a man to come forward and demonstrate that is refreshing because it shines a light on a less seen aspect of the dynamic. It also allowed people to watch the way that she behaved. And of course, people were shaking their heads and going, is she for real? 
you know, the whole a dog stepped on my bee and all of the various yes. things that she went on about that I could see in the comments from people who didn't understand narcissism, which just basically thought she is batshit crazy. She's not. She's a narcissist. You, I think it was your video, your commentary about that. It, I, I, I was yelling at, yes, this is spot on. You, you explained from what I recall that when uh, she mimicked, people didn't know why she pulled that face after yeah. she said, and then my dog stepped on a bee. And it was because she, in the narcissist's mind, she was immediately trying to mimic the emotion of the dog. Correct. There's a strange <laughs> glitch. The dog is an extension of her. So when she talked about the dog stepping on the bee, she, for that instance, became the dog grimacing as it stepped on the bee. And that's why she pulled that strange face. Because she has no boundary recognition. And what we do is we bolt people onto us and animals as well. We bolt everything onto us. So everything is an extension of us. And that therefore you can't see, you may have heard people often say, oh, I don't know where I begin and you end. And that sounds romantic. It's not. That's the way the narcissist sees people. That we basically, it's like the Borg assimilating you into mm. us by way of your character traits and so on and so forth. In that instance, her, her narcissism took her to the point of being the dog, which, of course, in that moment made sense to her. But to the rest of the world, they were thinking, what on earth is she doing? Why is she pulling that strange face and talking about the dog stepping on the bee? Do you ever just a personal question do you ever being an aware narcissist do you ever wish that you were not no do you ever wish that you wow okay why why would i let me ask you a question okay yeah <laughs> i don't have an answer why would you okay. yeah because you don't yeah i am effective um, you might not think that I am. Other people, and I'm not insulted by that because it, I'm able, I am easily able to deal with that. But I understand, you see, because I can sort of step between two worlds. As there'll be some people who say, well, HG, you hurt people. So you get in my way, that's what happens. But I am successful. I have lots of friends. It's very easy for me to forge a romantic relationship. If that doesn't work out, I just find another one. That doesn't bother me. It might bother other people. It doesn't bother me. I can do what I please. I travel a lot. I have an interesting and demanding and challenging professional role, which stimulates me and gives me access to the prime aims. So I'm effective at what I do. And therefore, mm. I revel in the manipulation of people because it stops me getting bored. I see people as playthings. And I fully comprehend that other people will think, well, that's a despicable way to lead your life. If you're, that's your view of me, you're entitled to express that opinion. I do not agree with it, but you are allowed to express that opinion. Of course you are. In the same way, I would say I'd hate to be an empath. It's weak. You don't see me curled up in the fetal position crying over the loss of a relationship. You don't see me wandering around going, but why, but why, but why? Unable to function. Mm. Unable to understand. Mm -hmm. it's differing perspectives and of course people would say but we get to feel love we get to feel joy good for you you enjoy that then i don't need it that's so interesting to me i um i had a couple more questions here i know i'm going to have you for a few more minutes do you think mm -hmm. you mentioned that the, time, yeah. that narcissism is a lot more prevalent than people think i think so mm -hmm. as well and in all the cluster b what are called the cluster b personality disorders i think they're grossly underestimated what what is your what's your take on that like what do you think the true numbers are well anecdotally because of course we don't have any reliable survey that's ever been conducted to determine that based upon my own interactions of the narcissists that i know in my world and i do interact with a lot of people i put it at one in six wow yeah hmm. I, th I think that's i think that's closer to the truth I've been one of, one of the reasons I'm grateful for having to learn more about narcissism, for having had people who I suspect are narcissists um, in my life at different times is because I think it's helped me understand things on a macro level more. And this relates mm -hmm. more to maybe the stuff that my audience um, that we usually talk about is once I understood how an individual narcissist functions or understood it better it was easier for me to 
then understand a little better different sort of uh, psychopathic ideologies they might be described or to understand politicians better. And I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. When I heard Justin Trudeau calling the truckers who were protesting for their right not to have to take a certain medical intervention, <laughs> calling mm -hmm. them the authoritarians, you know, mm -hmm. that to me immediately, I thought that's Darvo. That's deny and reverse mm -hmm. victim and offender. And mm -hmm. do, do you think that there's, um, even if someone doesn't need to know this for personal reasons, do you think that there's a benefit for learning about how cluster, the, the different cluster B personality disorders and how narcissists operate? Does it have any? Absolutely. There are two layers to this. Most people, of course, come across it as a consequence of personal and direct involvement with the narcissist, usually in a romantic setting or a familial one. And they can't make sense of that person's behaviors. And then eventually they stumble upon work about narcissism and it starts to click for them. But even if you've never personally experienced it, so you've not been in a romantic relationship with a narcissist or there isn't one in your family, knowing about and understanding it is a very powerful weapon to have because it'll enable you to make sense of that customer that you had who you just could not satisfy and that you bent over backwards, where now you'd realize I should have just given them their money back and left it at that and ceased all communication with them. That difficult neighbor who was always going on about the overhanging branches from the apple tree that you couldn't get to see sense, rhyme, nor reason. Now you realize that the pattern of behaviors are commensurate with that of a narcissist. And again, what you ought to have done was either use the law in relation to them or just no longer try and reason with them because it got you nowhere. It helps you make sense of the politicians and their behaviors. Or why did that pop star embark upon such self-destructive behaviors? They seem to have it all. And then they went around pestering and the whole sort of hashtag me too behaviors. It really does give you the keys to understanding much of the world. Many of my clients, after having helped them extract themselves from a personal situation, Carrie, then go down the rabbit hole with the breadth of my work and say it really has enabled them to understand so much of the way that the world works that the narcissists are invariably the ones that are the decision makers get themselves into positions of power and make life so difficult for many people. It's also in the interest of balance, of course, many of my kind that enrich the human experience because of our drive through all the prime aims of fame and power and money that we create things, that we're innovators, that we create fantastic works of art and literature and music and so forth. Of course, not all narcissists do that. There are many non-narcissists that do so also. But the point is that when you start to understand narcissism and psychopathy, you don't have to like it. But if you understand it, not only will it protect you personally, it'll enable you to make so much more sense of the world around you. And to that end, it's hugely important. I couldn't agree more. We're we're currently a deep program book club reading a book called Political Panerology, which is okay. the the I think the subtitle is the science of evil. And he basically says, you know, we've looked at uh, totalitarian um, ideologies throughout history. We've looked at it with a historical lens. We've looked at it with a political lens, but we should be looking at it with a psychological lens because that helps us make more sense of it. And absolutely. Yeah. I, yeah, I agree. And I agree entirely with that approach. You want to understand what drives an individual to create the regime that they have. You need to look at the psychology of that individual behind all of these things is the concept of the true believer. It creates a totalitarian regime that creates the cult that creates the business empire. There'll be people within that who think, well, I don't really agree with what we're doing here, but, I need a pay packet, so I recognize that it's morally reprehensible, but I'll, I'll go along with it. But somewhere in that chain of command, there is a true believer. Take, for example, do you think Adolf Hitler popped back to his lair, cracked open a bottle of whiskey and said, oh, goodness me, I'm an awful human being for gassing all of those Jews, but hey, you know, I've got to do it to create Lebensraum for the German people. No, he absolutely believed that he was doing the right thing. So he has to have a total, fervent, committed belief in what he's doing. And that's what the narcissism does. The narcissism doesn't leave room for doubt. It doesn't leave room for hesitation. He has to apply the pursuit of the prime aims without uh, hesitation, demurment, or, or reflection.
And so if you look at the psychology of these individuals, many of these leaders, both on the left and on the right, you will see what's at the heart of it. And of course, the environment, such as political power, is such an attractor for our kind. If you've got power that you can tell people what to do, you've got control over them. That is the central tenet of what narcissism craves. You also have the adoration or hatred of millions of people, massive amounts of fuel, which is precisely what our narcissism requires. You also have the opportunity to strip people of their character traits, which is what the narcissism needs. And then there's all those residual benefits, the wealth, the access to networks, the facade, the crushing of enemies, etc. So a political environment is absolute honeypot for our kind. I used to think that it was mostly well-intentioned people who went into politics and in the past few years I've that's completely turned on its head and now now think most of them are narcissists or they are psychopaths. there are there are some there are some genuinely well-intentioned people that go into political into politics get they invariably get chewed up and spat out some occasionally get to the top but it's very rare then there are those that believe that they're well-intentioned but it's just a very good facade and they're narcissists uh, there are some although they tend to be more involved in coups and uh, overthrowing power who are more about uh, straight uh, shooting from the lip, straight talking, uh, that they don't operate with a facade. And it's basically, I'm taking over because this country needs strong leadership, so I am suspending the democratic process and this is a coup d'etat. So mm. they'll deal with it that way. But ultimately, most operators within that are narcissists. Why? One, as I've just mentioned, it's a place that caters to our prime aims. And two, it becomes a self-perpetuating place. In order to survive in it, who's the best people to survive in it? Narcissists. So it just brings more and more in. And if you go in there and you're not a narcissist, as I say, you might get, you might survive up to a point. But the, the environment that's created, basically, it's a nest of vipers. A narcissist better suited. Not all narcissists, I hasten to add, but some. And I made mention of that in one of the recent videos about Harry's wife, where there was a suggestion of her taking a tilt at the presidency in 2024, which is quite hilarious. <laughs> I have to watch that one. I haven't seen that one yet. Yeah. Um, do. Have you ever thought about giving up this whole narcissism thing and just doing audiobooks? Because you have a great voice. Thank That's you. a joke. I <laughs> repeatedly need to revisit my own books, of which there are over 50. <laughs> To, to narrate them so that would be the starting point to do that and uh, I may well decide on a sort of kind of sabbatical where I sit down and do all of that I do of course for those people who don't want to listen to me here talking about uh, hear me talking about narcissism I do have a separate sister channel called the treasure trove where you can listen to me narrate books and poetry and all oh I didn't stuff. know that yeah. Okay. That's what I'm talking so, about. Do you read stuff about hobbits and stuff? Because that's what I would imagine you. I do. So, <laughs> so in there, there's, there's the abyss. There's Wuthering Heights. There's oh Sleepy gosh. Hollow. There's a okay. Of poetry. I do some Edgar Allan Poe. So there's all sorts, and I'm always open to people making suggestions. I dip in and out of that. So there'll be a splurge of me putting material there. But I hope, I'd, I'd like more people actually to go and subscribe to that channel because repeatedly people do say, I, I enjoy listening to your voice, HG, and it is, of course, a weapon that I have. And many people say yeah. it's not meant as an insult. I listen to you at night because you help me sleep. Uh, that's because of the natural cadence and depth of my uh, baritone voice. It's quite uh, causes people to feel at ease and uh, yeah. lulls them into a sleep so yes go but uh, go to the treasure trove uh, kerry and subscribe there and uh, you'll have a a lovely repository of marvelous uh, audio uh, narrations conducted by me i am going to make one final joke about the the just the whole dynamic with, with narcissists and how you're saying you know your voice is a weapon when i first talked about interviewing you with a friend a year over a year ago and i was like but i and i told him what i said to you at the beginning but i, I really like him listen to his video and i'm like you know he seems like he has a heart of gold i could change him <laughs> Which is, yeah. that's just me being self-aware and stupid i know <laughs> well it, it's honest of you and it's important to flag those things and make you yeah. realize that uh, those are well-intentioned uh, i'm calling desires, myself out but, but completely misplaced completely misplaced um 
again, tell people where they can find you. Thank you so much mm -hmm. for sharing your expertise. And I, I highly recommend you guys go and check out the channel. There's loads of free content. If you're, if you're not looking to do, um, you know, a consultation, but if you do need help, like there's consultation, there's paid content, tell people where they can find that. Certainly. My blog is narcsite.com, which is N-A-R-C-S-I-T-E.com. Wealth of material there, which will give you access to consultations, the Knowledge Vault, etc. Or you can go to my YouTube channel, which is HG Tudor, Knowing the Narcissist, the Ultra. And as mentioned earlier, there's over 3,400 videos that you can wade in, covering so many different aspects of narcissism, the narcissistic dynamic, and learning more about famous and infamous people that are narcissists as well. So I'd encourage people to fill their boots. Thank you, HG Tudor. You're very welcome. Thank you to today's sponsor, the Church on the Square of Georgetown, Texas, which happens to be my church. My church is no longer allowed to advertise on Facebook, which is unfortunate because that's how I and a lot of other church members originally found them. They've been told that they violate community standards. Uh, there's no details there of what that means, but you guys know the score. Anyway, since they're not allowed to advertise, I'm here to give them a plug. You can find them online at thechurchonthesquare.org. You can also find videos of all the sermons and some other other kinds of uh, content on their YouTube page at Church on the Square. You can also join us. If you happen to be in the Georgetown, Texas area, we meet every Sunday at Ken's Guitars. That's K-E-N-Z, Ken's Guitars, right on the Georgetown Square. We meet outside, right on the square. Sometimes, if the weather's nice, you might find us there. You might find us outside uh, in front of Ken's. But if you're local, I hope to see you. Thank you.